liberal who managed to grab things. He was sensational. We're on our way. We're talking about our guests tonight. Slim Jim's going to be here. Uh, thank you, Brandon. in your pocket. Brandon's telling me to put that in my pocket. It's my phone. If we don't put it in my pocket, it goes zzz. The letters are coming. Thank you, sir. That's terrific. Coffee's here. Pen's here. The guests are getting made up out there. Uh, the crew's ready to go. Yeah? Yeah, it's like... Anyway, you know. Over here now. There we are. At 50, is she too old to become a new mum? Letter number one. Second letter tonight from not too far away in Cannington. Is it any wonder that we come to despise these bloodsuckers? Oh, who do you reckon the bloodsuckers are? We've got one of them. No, we can't say that. <laughs> um, politicians who actually are pensioned off on hundreds of thousands of dollars per year when... What do we get when we retire from the pension? Can't rely on it anymore. Final letter tonight. I can't get my teenagers off their social media or gaming devices. Common problem? I think so. Let's see what the panellists have got to say. Sweet and sour, starting right now. Don't go away, I'm going to have coffee. Cheers. Got a problem, big or small, would a miracle be nice? Our monthly crew is back, churning out advice. You might even laugh a bit in the following half hour. Park your backside on the couch, cos baby, it's time for Sweet and Sour. Right here on Sweet and Sour. Pour some sugar on there, baby. It's time for Sweet and Sour. How's about some chili? It's time for Sweet and Sour. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sweet and Sour. I'm not allowed to say good evening anymore because we go through the daytime as well. We're screened everywhere now. So good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to Sweet and Sour. Lovely to have your company here at Sweet and Sour. Gary Mitchell with you for the next half hour. My mate, who I haven't seen for 12 months almost. That probably goes for all of the panellists tonight. Hello, Slim. Good to see you, Gary. It's good to be back. Oh, it's good to have you. How did you go with your theatre stint? Yeah, Beauty and the Beast went really well at the Regal. We what did. were you playing? What was your character? Tell them all at home. Monsieur D'Arc, the, the arch-villain, the, uh, the keeper of the asylum. And you loved playing. Oh, I did, I actually. loved your mutton chops. Yeah, it was good, wasn't that it? That was sensational. It wasn't too popular at home, so it had to come off the day after we finished the show. So. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but it was good. Wouldn't you keep it? No, no, well, no. What, the missus goes now, get rid of that? No, no, if I, if I want to get anywhere with the missus, I've got to get rid of it. That's it, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Shall I hold this book up, Tanya? There we go. Welcome to the show for the first time. Life coach, Tanya Van Ziel. What nationality is that Van Ziel bit? It's actually Dutch. It's a Dutch? It's a Dutch name. It's a, well, so a Greek girl's got a Dutch name. How does that work? Oh, I know, uh, I know. Bit of fence jumping going on. Oh, I know. Common story. What's the spiritual dimension? It's essentially a self-help book that can assist with overthinking, which can actually lead to states of depression and anxiety and just states of unhappiness. Well, then you're well qualified to be on the show tonight. Welcome. Hope Thank you enjoy you. it. You haven't been here for ages. I haven't. I've where missed are, where you. Where have you been, Nick? I am now the Artistic Director of Playback Theatre. Wow. Which do you is... get any time to yourself? Yes, I do. Do you? Yes. That's why you're here tonight, so of I course. do yoga and I go for walks on the beach and I climb trees with my boys. So you have a good state of balance. I do. You work hard and you relax well. And, and fit you in there somewhere. Oh, well, I'm glad you did. Show. Nice to have you back. <laughs> Speaking of trying to get someone on, Peter, you must be the golden child of the Liberal Party at the moment because against all odds, you did better than most. Yours, congratulations, sir. Welcome back, and you are an amazing fighter and an amazing campaigner. And I'm, it sounds like I'm pissing in his pocket, but this guy over here did an amazing job. And how many politicians are, are left in uh, the Liberal side of Parliament in state uh, in the state Parliament? Not too many. We've got 13 in the lower house, Gary. But my goodness, that's so long ago. That was more than six months ago. Well, I haven't seven seen you for ago. that long. But it's great to be here. Good to have um, you here, sir. It's taken a while to get our diaries in sync for your people to talk to my you people. You are very busy but now. You know I love coming on here. I do know you love coming on here. No, so I enjoy I, it. So I would persist and persist and persist. Good to have you here. Unfortunately, we've got one of those really snarly letters, letter two, about politicians, but you'll set us straight, won't you? Oh, we'll see how we go. Hey? <laughs> All right, mate. Good to have you back. Good to have everyone here. And here we go. This one's titled Pregnant Pause Dear Mitch and Panel. She's driving herself nuts over having a baby. We've been married for eight years and haven't been lucky enough to fall pregnant naturally for the last four years. 
Uh, oh, sorry. And for the last four years, we've spent a fortune in and out of fertility clinics trying for a child of our own. She's turning 50 next year. I'm 62. And every time there is a new special uh, on older women in their 50s and 60s on having babies, she records it. She's determined to have a baby. We're too old to adopt, which is just plain stupid because we would be able to provide a very safe, comfortable, healthy and nurturing environment for a child. But is a child everything in life? At 50, is she too old to become a new mum? I ask these questions every day and the experts are also trying to suggest to her that it just may not happen for us. Is this simply a futile yet expensive exercise that will just wreck our sanity because soon it will send me around the bend as well. What's, uh, what's the right thing for all of us here, please? It comes to us from Brian of North Adelaide in South Australia. Pete, he's spending a lot of money. He's a 62-year-old man. His wife's going to be 50. She still wants a baby. Brian, you're right and she's right. There's no right and wrong in this. It's how each person feels and one thing I do agree with you is 50 years old you should be able to adopt I don't think age should yeah. be a barrier I mean we've seen some uh, pretty well-known people Rupert Murdoch and the like have babies in their 70s and managed to bring them up sounds like this couple have got the funds to do it uh, she wants to do it Brian if it's in the ladies I don't know what her name is but if it's in the lady's psyche that she wants a baby and it. you love her she's your wife just persist with it and see how you go um, it's a great thing if you can achieve it but also try to be there and perhaps Tanya can help us with all that stuff if it just doesn't work out if for this lady where will she end up Pete you'd be interested in this um, father of Federation Henry Parks was 82 when he had his last child well there you are mm, the housekeeper had a lot to do with it she was 18 at the time and he <laughs> <laughs> sounds a bit seedy if you ask me righto who's who's right here well, uh, I don't think it's a case of being right and wrong. I am a mum of two boys and, and being a mother has been the most astounding thing that ever happened to me. So I understand that, that ache and that love for a child. But it sounds like she's got a lot of beautiful maternal love to give and I think if it's not happening for them, by all means keep supporting her and keep trying but you would be an incredible candidate for a foster family yeah. so if you've got that love uh, to give there are children in Australia who who would benefit from your wisdom being slightly older your patience and you're obviously desperate to put your arms and around a child and love them good for you Tam what do you think's going on here well Brian it's very difficult to tell a woman determined to have a baby to let go of her dream it's, it's actually impossible and um, I think she's got so much um, happiness attached to it and she's got a lot of energy attached to it so it's, it's really a difficult thing to break. But I understand that you're going nuts, that's fair enough, I can understand that. What you need to do is shift your energy from your head space to your heart space and that means don't overthink it, Aww. just go with the flow make it a loving exercise just to Don't stress. A, a, yeah adopt the notion that if it happens it happens if it doesn't it wasn't meant to be you know sometimes in life our biggest challenges provide the best opportunity for our spiritual growth so this may be something that you can both learn from and you know don't be attached to either outcome you know whatever happens happens yeah. Um, He's going to have a tough time trying to get his wife to accept the, the negative outcome if they don't actually. Well, she probably baby. will because she's how old? 50 now. So she hasn't got a long time and it will be when she's not able to have a baby, it's, it's a lot easier to accept. Yep. But while there's a little no bit choice. of hope, she won't let go. So I don't think you should either. And 50 is not too old. I mean, there's many women 60 and over that have successfully had children and this may well be your time. How come it's been so long finding you? you that's a great bit of advice. Slim, give us the rap. <laughs> well, I got married at 36, had my first of three children at 38, and I was very conscious at the time that maybe I'd be too old to sort of father my children. And it's still a bit of a concern now, especially when I sit around the table and my 16-year-old says, now that I'm 54, Dad, you're so old. You're so old. But in, in regards to this, actually not even my, my son says it to me, but my, my other two kids, my other two daughters say it to me as well. But in my opinion, if you are fertile and have the opportunity of having a child it's a wonderful experience it's it's it'll enrich your life like nothing else that you can possibly um, be a part of I believe and I think uh, 
if the opportunity is there to have a child, go ahead and have a child because I think you're, uh, as a couple, you'll, uh, you'll appreciate it more than you realise. Terrific. We asked you people at home, uh, should women seek to fall pregnant if they're over the age of 50? And here's what you said. Here you go, coming up right now on the screen. 32% said yes, over the age of 50, she's too old. And 68% said no. That's interesting, isn't it? It's an interesting mindset in our community. Not what I thought people would suggest. Wow, amazing. So much for do whatever you want to do. Go and chase your own dreams. When we come back, we're going to be talking about uh, parliamentary pensions and how they compare to what the rest of us score as well. There's an expert on the corner down there. He's got all the stats. It's Nick Webbs. When we come back, don't go away. Sweet and sour. <laughs> Smarty, that was good. Getting in touch with Sweet and Sour is easy. Just head to sweetandsour.net.au to send us a letter. And while you're there, why not check out our past episodes? Plus, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And for a behind-the-scenes look at Sweet and Sour, check us out on Instagram. And for everyone who does send us a letter, we're going to send you to the movies, courtesy of Natalie Cameron and NRC Communications. And the movie we're sending you to this week is... Does anybody remember? No, the silence from the panel. Final portrait. Oh, very good. Oh. Starring Australian Academy Award winner Jeffrey Rush. How good is Slim? It's letter two. Hi, sweet and sour. My widow or dad survives on a little over $400 per week on the pension, and that's it. You know, he's so good, not only does he get by, but he also manages to save a small amount nearly every week. I was completely disgusted last week when I read of certain federal politicians who are receiving an annual pension of over 280000 What is that? Seriously, are these politicians any more deserving or needy than my dad? Why do we have this obscene feeding trough? How is it that we seem to have created a class of political elites who continue to suck on the tax teat way beyond what the rest of us could ever expect? How is it... How is this in any way fair? Is it any wonder that we come to despise these bloodsuckers? What can I do about it? Who do I speak to? I have no doubt that everyone feels the same because everyone I speak to just does. We have these politicians who purport to represent us and yet we have zero ability to sit on any panel adjudicating what is a fair and reasonable pension for any of them. How do we tackle this head on? It's appalling. No wonder these union, union officials break their neck climbing over one another for a seat in Parliament. It's got to stop. Janice of Cannington must be happy out there in WA. Slim, you're first on that one, sir. Yeah, Janice, I'm not that concerned about a pension of $280,000 for a federal politician in particular because I think the work they do, which most people don't realise, and I'm sure Peter knows a lot better than we do even on the state level, that the hours they put in and, and the benefits they, they gain other Australians in the, either their electorate or th throughout the country um, can never be sort of truly valued, I don't think. But uh, what really concerns me is the actual the pay, the pay structure for most CEOs in major companies. I mean, there was a recent story about uh, was it $8 million, I think. It was 12 was, Post? 12, 12, Australia yeah, Post. Australia Post, that's the one. I was thinking of it. I find that completely obscene. It'd be great if they made $12 million and then, you know, philanthropically passed on, you know, $10 million of it. I mean, how much money do you need to live? I think it's just extreme. And I, I, I find what CEOs are getting paid, be it in banking or, or as Australia Post or any other utility, is obscene. But that's, so that's I don't where we've got to, about that. I mean, and it's not that bloke's fault. He negotiated a fantastic contract for himself, as any one of us would do. The obscene thing is that we sit back and we don't react until it's too late. And you're writing in now. When was the last time you actually went to a federal politician and said, oi, uh, this is what I'd like to see? Because I ask that question all the time. But Gary, there has been a, a very negative reaction across Australia, I think, for what CEOs, you know, pay no outs question. were. Or no annual question. Pays, no question. Disparity, pay disparity in the community is huge. Terrible. Ten. Well, Janice was. Janice, Janice, Janice of Kennington um, in WA. It's fantastic to hear how well your daddy's doing. That's yeah. really great. But yes, I agree, it's not fair. And yes, I agree, things should change. But I also believe that change in the world doesn't happen from top down, it happens from the bottom upwards. Dead it right. filters upwards and it starts with you. So um, it's, it's a big change of consciousness. There's a whole lot of consciousness holding those structures together. And it's not gonna happen overnight, but if we all collectively 
agree, eventually, yes, sooner we, or later, it, we'll, sooner get or later, we'll get there. Process, that's all. But I will say, what I believe is true happiness doesn't come from money, and it sounds to me that your dad's a lot happier than some yeah. of those politicians. It sounds like your dad's Sorry, a lot Pete. happier than you are. <laughs> come on, Nick. Well, Janice, I think uh, my dad lives with me. Um, now and he uh, and we're really having a wonderful time together and uh, it was also because of a little bit of of the money thing I was needing some helping out um, trying to pay a mortgage and trying to keep afloat and I think things are really expensive just for like the rest on the of ground. us everybody is battling it's the pensioners it's the single parents it's the parents it's the single people you know I know young people that I'm teaching now who who can't even fathom ever being able to afford their own homes because they're paying off uni debt. So, I mean, I, that's something I feel really strongly about is 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 uni debt, asking uni students to 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 sign their lives away. Basically, you'll be in debt forever to pay this back. So, I mean, I understand your your anger at the politicians, but they're doing a job of running the country and should be paid accordingly. But I also think there's other things you can be angry about as well. Your dad seems to be doing quite well. And someone who's probably got all the information on this one. Pete. Well Janice, I agree with you that politicians shouldn't be getting these extraordinary pensions and guess what? It's already been fixed. In 2004 the Federal Parliament abolished parliamentary pensions for people coming in after 2004. In Western Australia we did it in 2001. So there's a whole bunch of old pollies Tony Abbott being one of them, um, Anthony Albanese, here in WA, it's Mark McGowan and Colin Barnett. They're entitled to a pension whenever they finish. We don't. We just get the superannuation that everybody else does. And I think that's actually fair and reasonable. The thing I think that's really obscene is when you get these senior ministers or prime ministers, their advisors in their departments actually get paid more than they do. Isn't that bizarre? So when Mark McGowan gets advice from the head of his uh, Premier and Cabinet Department, that head of Premier and Cabinet is getting more. It's the same with Malcolm Turnbull and the head of his Prime Minister and Cabinet Department. And I think that's where we need to get some reform, as well as things like Australia Post, where they're not even competitive businesses and they get paid $10 million. I think that's pretty obscene too. Good on you, Pete. Um, we asked you people this question. Should politicians retire with a significantly greater pension than the rest of us? Well, Pete's answered that and the panel's answered that. But here's what you said. You all agree. We all agree. And there it is on the screen right now. Only 9% said, yeah, they should get significantly Who greater. Who those people? <laughs> they probably misread the question. You know, Bobby Kennedy's normal negative. 20% of yeah, people won't understand said, the yeah. question. So there we go. When we come back, <laughs> we're talking about cyber kids. Who's got some of those? Oh, I have. Oh, I do. I don't. Yeah. I'm too tough. See you soon. Mm, with all the sour around, we need some sweet. Who are the sweet ones on the panel tonight? Tune in with Gary Mitchell, Sweet and Sour. Teenage G portfolio. Welcome back. Hi, Sweet and Sour. I can't get my teenagers off their social media or gaming devices. The eldest comes home from school, goes straight to his room, hops online immediately, and doesn't come out until after dinner. And every evening he asks if he can take his meal to his room. The answer is always no. He then continues until I close his lights at 10 p.m. At some point in all of that, he has to do his homework. His sister is identical in behaviour, but rather than gaming, she spends her time watching YouTube videos and Skyping her friends. Lights out at 10 p.m. too. Almost every night, these kids are still awake at 11.30 when my husband and I head to bed, and they are both using their smartphones in the dark to keep gaming, watching or Skyping. And the screaming matches to switch off have become a typical part of the evening ritual. They're always so tired in the mornings because of it. Where can this all lead? What sort of adults will they turn out to be? What sort of society will, will this create? I know every generation thinks the next generation is a worry, but these are my kids, mine. And I, I, I'm very worried for their future health and relationships. Where do the panellists think this is leading us all and what can be done to get them back to normal? Switching off the internet for a week is useless. We've done it at least three times in the last year and that's Penny of Windsor in Victoria. Nick, you're up first. 
All right, uh, this makes me really angry because I feel you're not being tough enough on your kids. When I worked in prison for a year, I was teaching drama um, and it was a medium security male prison and it was about, the drama was about connection and reconnecting because what happens is this is the time that your children are the most vulnerable to everything and they can be so manipulated in the space and they can become so disconnected because it's like drugs, it's like candy, it's mm. like a sugar addiction. Social media is an addiction Dopamine and it turn is off. so good at disconnecting. You need family and you need connection time, you need to be sitting at a dinner table and you need to take those mobile phones away from them and you need to ground them. There's things that you can do for teenagers because Acacia Prison is full of people who became disconnected and they became vulnerable. Fantastic. Pete. Penny. When I was growing up, funnily enough, in Windsor, in Victoria, parents well, were worried about television. Too much television for their teenagers. Today we worry about these devices. I tell you what, it's not your kids' fault. They're not failing. I think it's you that's failing as a parent. You've got to set some boundaries and some guidelines. And um, it's like Nick said, you, you do have to sit there and make some rules. Yeah. And you know what, at the end of the day, there's a switch that is on the wall that connects to your modem. And if it doesn't work, switch it off. You set the rules, set the ground rules, and they'll follow. And you say, how are these kids gonna turn out? Well, kids without boundaries end up being adults without boundaries and without an idea of what it's like to go coexist in the world. So turn it back around, work out how best you can discipline your kids and get them on the same page. And if you need a bit of tough love, give them a bit of tough love. In the end, they're actually gonna thank you for it. Well, thank you. Slim. Yeah, I've had issues that I'm of late where I've had to be as stern as I possibly can be in trying to retrieve our children's attention away from social media or just, you know, devices in general. And uh, I must admit that even I was surprised at the negative reaction I got from my kids over it and how um, extreme their reaction was to, to what I was suggesting, which was pretty much no uh, social media or phones and so forth at the dinner table. So where you could actually discuss and have a conversation. Uh, similarly, all homework had to be completed before they were on their devices. Uh, music playing in the background wasn't too bad, but everything else had to be shut down. And um, I really wanted the, all the media devices to come out onto the kitchen bench to be powered up overnight, which is another one of our solutions, mm. which I think is good. Not that we've been that successful with it, but we've been you know, trying. And I think it's a necessity because I do think the kids are escaping to this, this void of you know, social media oh, yeah. and, and distractions and so forth. And I think they need to, as, as mentioned, they need boundaries. And really, the only person that can really legitimately put boundaries on their children is, is the parents. Come on in, Tan. Final word. OK. Penny, you can't get your children off social media or gaming devices. You or five million other parents across Australia. <laughs> Look, I worry about this problem because I see these devices as an extension of the mind. And as you know, the overuse of the mind leads to states of the mind. And so with an adult, if you're overusing your mind, you bring your attention to your inner body. So with a child, what you do is get them involved in physical activity. One great way to get your children out of their mindset and start being is buy a pet. A dog's a great thing because it pulls buy kids out of the mindset into the, into the being. Pets are a great way to get us into being. And so buy a pet, go for a walk around the park with the family every night. Go for a walk. That's what we're all going to do. We've got to go. Thank Jim, thank, thank Tanya, thank Nick, and thank Pete for being with us tonight. Thank our terrific crew, and thanks for being at home watching us tonight, Australia. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. See you later. See you later. Here we go.